meaning the, the, the goal is actually regime change. They want to overthrow Vladimir Putin by creating a uh, civil dissent. When we go <laughs> in there and we find no weapons of mass destruction and find out we invaded a nation under false pressure, are you going to invite me back on and you apologize to the American people for beating the, the drum war? And in defense of Bill O'Reilly, he tried to get me on to do just that. Fox right. News would not allow it. And he said, um, I tried to get him on. They won't let me, but I owe him an apology because he was absolutely right. So I give Bill O'Reilly credit wow. for that. I'm not a big fan of his opinions, but yeah. when it came to, you know, it came to being a man about about doing what he said he was going to do, he did. Wolf Blitzer once gave me sort of a, a backhanded, uh, I'm sorry, um, and a couple other people at CNN did the same. But for the most part, no, they just ignored it, pretended it didn't happen. Well, I mean, we're 10 days into uh, into the invasion of Ukraine by, by Russia. Um, it's a major military incursion. This is a major military operation. Uh, Russia may have sought to downplay it um, early on by calling it a uh, sensitive military operation or something of that nature. No, it's it's, it's just an outright full-scale military invasion of a, of a neighboring country. And we're 10 days into it. Uh, Somehow, the mainstream media claims to have the Russian playbook, uh, because I keep hearing that uh, that the invasion isn't going according to plan, that the Russian playbook is flawed. You know, when I look at it from a from a military perspective, and I spent a number of years early on in my career training to uh, close with and destroy the Soviet army through firepower maneuver. I mean, I I know these guys. I've studied them for 35 years. Uh, their doctrine, uh, their equipment, uh, their tactics, their operations. Um, what we're seeing here is a multi-axis invasion uh, that seeks to fix enemy forces in place, destroy enemy command and control, surround enemy forces, and uh, seize uh, strategic points of, of interest, bypassing built-up areas where the where the fighting would be too heavy, just not getting ahead of the game. The rate of advance of this invasion is faster than the rate of advance of the German blitzkrieg in World War II. So anybody's going, well, this, this is slow. No, it's the fastest advance in history. Here that the Ukrainian army you know, consists of 260,000 regular forces trained and equipped to NATO standards with, with cohesive command and control, well-led officers, uh, supported by another 200, 300,000 reservists and auxiliaries. So the Russians came in with 190, 200,000 troops facing off against 600,000 troops. Normally, in a military campaign, you want a three-to-one advantage of, of troops on the offensive side. The Russians are coming in literally with a one-to-three, one-to-four disadvantage. For every Russian killed, six Ukrainians are This is an absolute route, an absolute route. One of the things that appears to be slowing it down is the Russian stated intent of not killing Ukrainian soldiers. I was as surprised as anyone when they started this offensive with literally one hand tied behind their back coming in very light, coming in very soft, trying to negotiate their way through uh, built up areas so as to reduce uh, civilian casualties and reduce damage to civilian infrastructure. They also sought to not um, decapitate, meaning annihilate uh, Ukrainian soldiers in their barracks as they could have. Instead, they let them sleep and they said, uh, you know, we just prefer that you stay in your barracks and don't fight us because our qualm isn't with you. Our qualm is with the bigger fish. Unfortunately for the Russians, uh, the Ukrainians uh, decided to fight, and they're fighting very effectively. I'm never going to denigrate the courage and the determination of the uh, of the Ukrainian army. Um, they're they're going up against a very well trained Russian military, very well equipped Russian military, who has superior tactics and operations, and they're doing it. The Ukrainians are putting up a very solid fight, but they're losing. They're losing decisively, and uh, I think sooner or later, sooner rather than later, you're going to see. Um, large-scale surrenders as they run out of ammunition, they run out of food, they run out of water, they run out of fuel, given the choice of either a futile resistance or death. One of the things they, they keep harping on is they, they keep saying in one instance after another that Russia or the Russian military is trying to kill civilians, is aiming at civilian targets, is, uh, you know, claiming that there's a, a ceasefire and then shooting civilians. In your in your understanding, how much is the Russian military actually going after civilians? The Russian military has foregone its greatest advantage in modern warfare, which is overwhelming fire superiority. Uh, the normal Russian tactic is to fix your location, 
and then obliterate your location with um, massed fires, artillery, multiple rocket launchers, mortars, uh, and then steamroll through your location until they find the next location, then you repeat as necessary. Uh, it's a very effective tactic. It, uh, it's a very brutal tactic. It's one that if applied to an enemy formation uh, operating in a uh, built-up area uh, or a heavily populated uh, suburban area would result in um, tens of thousands of civilians dying. The Russians have foregone this. They're not using this tactic at all. When they do fire, it's based upon solid intelligence about enemy capabilities, enemy locations. Now, war is an imperfect science. I'll say that as somebody who's waged it. You think you have intelligence about a target, you do your best to put munitions on the target to achieve a desired effect, only to find out that you were wrong about the intelligence or the munitions didn't perform as, um, as, as designed. <clears throat> Anytime there's a war in an area where civilians exist, the civilians pay the heaviest price. And that's yeah. happening now. But to call this a deliberate targeting by the Russians is just an absolute deviation from reality. The Russians are being very, very circumspect in their use of uh, weapons. When they mm -hmm. use weapons, for instance, in Kharkov, they show um, you know, uh, multiple rocket launchers impacting in a residential neighborhood. What they're not telling you is that the Russians had sent in a, a reconnaissance mission earlier um, that got ambushed and annihilated by Ukrainian forces dug in in that residential area. This makes it a legitimate military target. I'm sorry, that's what war is. If you choose to fight in a residential area, then you can't, it's not a war crime to, uh, to, to take that out. Uh, you know, the Russians, I think the one place that the Russians are failing right now is, um, is the propaganda aspect. I'm not saying that I want the Russians mm -hmm. to lie, but it would be nice mm -hmm. if the Russians put some um, perspective to, the, uh, to what they're facing. What they're facing isn't just propaganda from the Ukrainian government. Understand that the CIA is deeply embedded with the Ukrainian Ministry of Information and is responsible for, for running um, what's called an um, information operation. Uh, this is a covert or political action operation uh, that's been sanctioned by the President of the United States. And the reason why it has to be sanctioned is the CIA normally isn't allowed to manipulate information in a manner that affects the American public meaning they can tell lies and they do this very effectively, but they can't tell lies in a way that affects how the Americans view a, a subject. They're doing that right now. They're running an information operation, very sophisticated, that's designed to achieve a political result in Russia, meaning the, the, the goal is actually regime change. They want to overthrow Vladimir Putin by creating a civil dissent, and they match that civil dissent with an economic sanctions uh, policy and, and, and implementation, uh, which is designed to marry up. Uh, the sanctions aren't happening in a vacuum. The sanctions are specifically targeted against a certain class of person in Moscow who, who the United States feels is oriented towards the West. And by depriving them of the benefits of being affiliated with the West, you redefine their life. And now they're they want them to rise up. And this is a regime change operation. So Ukraine isn't just about exaggerating Ukrainian victories, as all militaries do, or diminishing Russian victories. It's about manipulating information in Russia and in Europe to get NATO. Remember, NATO was this dysfunctional organization reeling from the catastrophe of Afghanistan. How do you get them aligned with what's going on? How do you get them to oppose what the Russians are doing? You have to run an information operation designed to manipulate public opinion in Europe. And the indirect effect of this is that the American public is likewise uh, impacted by this because you can't have a situation where the CIA promulgates mistruths over here, uh, tells CNN, hey, yep, that's all a lie. That's all a lie. Don't, you can't report that. That's a lie. You need to report the truth. No, they're letting the lie live. And this can only be done with executive permission. The President of the United States, therefore, is engaged in an operation to deceive the American public. And that's what people need to know. Uh, you tweeted out, at this stage, any continuation of the Ukraine-Russian conflict will not alter the outcome and will only increase the tragic plight of the Ukrainian yeah. people. All those who argue in favor of more weapons and insurgency must admit they care more about NATO than the Ukrainian people. While our media and our, and our government agencies are, are manifesting, are creating this, uh, this care, the concern for the Ukrainian people, it's 
end result is that you're going to have more Ukrainian people getting killed because they're going to drag this thing out as long as possible. Yes. And, and, and this comes back to one of the root causes of this conflict, which is NATO's effort to expand further east uh, and incorporate Ukraine into the, the umbrella of NATO membership. Ukraine's suicidal insistence that this is what they want, even though they and NATO were confronted uh, over the course of 15 years. This isn't like Vladimir Putin woke up one night and went, oh, I got a headache. I'm going to invade Ukraine. This is concerted policy from Russia that has been articulated in great detail since Vladimir Putin addressed the Munich Security Conference in 2007. He laid down the foundation and said further eastward expansion is unacceptable. What did NATO do? They turned around in 2008, I think it was the Bucharest Conference, um, and they, um, they invited Ukraine and Georgia to become members. This prompted a detailed Russian response, which was effectively captured by the U.S. ambassador to Russia at the time, William Burns. He happens to be the CIA director. But back then, he was the, the U.S. ambassador to Russia. He wrote a memorandum that called Nyet Means Nyet, published in February 2009. And what he said is, the Russians have said, no, this is a red line. And then he said, this is a reasonable red line. I mean, we have to respect the Russians' perspective on this one. Uh, Ukraine, if it becomes a NATO member, will cause serious problems for Russia. So serious, and again, 2009, that Russia will use military force destroy Ukraine, seize Crimea, and seize the Donbass. Well, good Lord, what has happened today? And people yeah. are saying this is because Putin woke up with a migraine? No, this is because NATO and Ukraine conspired together to create the conditions for a war that they knew, what, 13 years ago was inevitable if they continued this policy. Both things can be true. You can what Russia is doing is wrong. Uh, it can be illegal under international law. Uh, you can be opposed to it, and also, you can see how NATO pushed Russia closer and closer to doing this, ignored their concerns, ignored their security concerns. Uh, NATO is, I think, seventeen countries now. Where there's been several uh, different moments in time where they where it's grown, and uh, NATO and, and Russia is now surrounded by a, an enemy military alliance in many ways. And then in 2014, we see the Maidan coup, which the U.S. Uh, backed, helped fund, and it involved heavy uh, Nazi uh, power that, that really made it happen. And we put in a, a U.S. friendly uh, kind of puppet government, or, or at least U.S. friendly government. No, literally a puppet government. Yeah. <laughs> Yats. Yats is my man. Remember Victoria Nuland? Yeah. Yats is my man. Oh, he became prime minister. So we know there's been fighting for the entire eight years in the Donbass, uh, yeah. Nazis killing 15,000 people. But people go, well, Zelensky's Jewish, so clearly you're making this stuff up. How much power do the, do, do the Nazi brigades, battalions have in Ukraine now? Well, let's just start again with the roots, what you said, 2014. The Maidan revolution started out as the Maidan peaceful protest, where there were Ukraine at the time was going through a, a very controversial uh, internal debate over do we align with the European Union or do we align with Russia? And it had been a debate that had been going on for more than 10 years, since 2004. And the current president at the time uh, had made the decision that he was going to uh, side with Russia. And so there was a significant portion of the, the Ukrainian population who had a gripe and they peacefully demonstrated. This was seized upon by the United States and the European Union, who empowered this radical nationalistic ideology that is headquartered in Lvov, Western uh, Ukraine. And, and you have to understand the history of Ukraine to know that that's an, an artificial appendage of Ukraine that was given to Ukraine at the end of the Second World War by Russia. It used to be part of Poland. It has more historical identity with the Austro-Hungarian Empire than it does with Kiev. That's just a, a reality. But these people were brought in. There was an eight-year insurgency fought, led by the CIA, uh, by these people against the Russians from 45 to 53. 300,000 people lost their lives, 30,000 Russian or Soviet security forces. I mean, this is major league warfare. Yeah. These people do not like Moscow. <laughs> they hate Moscow. <laughs> they do like a guy named Stepan Bandera. These are the people that when the, when the Germans came across in 1941, greeted them literally with song and flowers. They signed up by the hundreds of thousands to fight for Nazi Germany. 
They formed the death squads that killed the Jews. Bobby Yar in Kiev, where 30,000 Jews were killed. The triggers were pulled by Ukrainian auxiliary policemen from Western Ukraine. I mean, these are not the, the kind of people you want dating your sister or anything like that. These are bad people. Um, and they continue to exist today, and the U.S. empowered them. They came and they turned the Maidan demonstration into the Maidan revolution, a violent revolution, an extraordinarily violent revolution, which when they ousted the Ukrainian president, they didn't have the political numbers because overall in Ukraine, they're, they're a minority. They can't garner, you know, more than, I think the most they ever got was like 12% of the vote. Generally, they're, they're single digits, but they're very violent. And they threatened every single Ukrainian politician since then with death if they do anything that infringes on their nationalistic platform, which was to restrict Russian speakers. These are the guys that burned people to death in Odessa in May of 2014, shoving 150 people into a building, lighting it on fire, killing between 40 and 50 of them. These are the people that slaughtered people in the streets in Kharkov. These are the people that began the fighting in Donetsk and Lugansk. Uh, these are the people that tried to expend their fighting into Crimea. These are very violent people. Uh, when the fighting started in the Donbass, the people were looking for a solution. Uh, this group called the Normandy Format, Germany, France, Ukraine, with Russia as sort of as an overseer, met, and they came up with what's called the Minsk Accords, 2015. When the fighting first started in Lugansk and Donetsk, the, the, the Russian speakers there wanted to declare independence. And Putin said, no, you're part of Ukraine. You're part of Ukraine, now, but I will I will defend you. I will defend your right to have, you know be Russians. The the Minsk Accords was designed to give them special autonomy, so that they could protect their cultural and linguistic, but they would be politically part of Ukraine, a reasonable settlement to end the fighting. The nationalists said no. Uh, Poroshenko, who was the president at the time, came back. The nationalists literally said, "We will kill you if you implement." And literally, mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't like a like a fun, you know, we have January 6th here, that horrible day in American democracy where a, a demonstration turned into a riot that assaulted the Capitol. And we call that an insurrection. In Ukraine, every single president lives under the threat of imminent insurrection should he do anything that deviates from the platform of the far right wing neo-Nazis. Zelensky was elected president on a platform of peace. He got 80% hey, of the hey, hey, a comedian actor. He was a popular comedian with a popular show about being president. This is if we, America decided that during the height of West Wing, we're going to elect Martin Sheen. Right. Because he's presidential. No, he's an actor. Zelensky's an actor. He's not stupid. He's a lawyer. He's trained as a lawyer. Um, but he was handpicked by his billionaire oligarch mentor who owns the media empire that made Zelensky famous. So uh, Zelensky's on a TV show that this guy pays for. Zelensky performs in programs underwritten by this guy. Zelensky is literally the puppet of this oligarch. And this oligarch picks Zelensky to go up against Poroshenko, who is one of the most unpopular presidents at the time. Zelensky wins by supporting a platform of peace. The implication was he would go forward with Minsk. No sooner did he get elected than... The guy came in and said, you'll be hanging by the neck until dead, that one of the neo-Nazis. We will kill you. Not an idle threat. They will kill him because these neo-Nazis are everywhere. They formed this, this dead-sized force called Azov, and that got broken up as part of the, the agreement with the West that, you know, you can't have these standalone Nazi militias. So what did they do? Disband them? No. They put a battalion in every brigade in the Ukrainian military. So every brigade in the Ukrainian military now has a battalion of Nazis. Then they infiltrated their officers throughout the officer corps and the general staff. They are everywhere. They're in the security service, the intelligence service, the military. They've infiltrated the whole thing. And these are people who aren't afraid to kill in defense of their ideology. So Zelensky is 100% the puppet of these people. One of the reasons why he has such a hard line position today is he can't take a soft line. You want proof? One of the members of the first negotiating team that met with the Russians, and I don't know his name right off the top of my bat, uh, ha, head, but he was somebody who said, maybe we should think about neutrality to bring an end to this war. What happened to him when he got back? Pulled out, shot two times in the head, assassinated. Take a look at the photographs. The, the Nazis killed a negotiator because they didn't like his negotiating position. 
Yeah, you, you don't get that that context on CNN. For those who really want to see this end, and I don't mean the kind of faux outrage, let's put our uh, you know Ukrainian colors on the thumbnail of our Facebook account and, and that's it. Uh, but I mean genuinely want to see this over because that's the only way you're going to see killing stop. What is it? What like? How do you see this ending? What what needs to happen? Well, I'm I'm just going to be brutally honest. This will end when Vladimir Putin wants it to end, which means uh, it'll end when um, the Russians achieve total victory. Now, Russian total victory isn't, you know, Nazi total victory or Roman total victory, where you kill every man and steal the women and enslave the children. Total victory is exactly what the Russian negotiators have said. This war will end. The moment Ukraine changes its constitution, because one of the things Zelensky did is change the constitution so that NATO membership is now constitutionally required. So the the Russians said, change your constitution and then enter into a formal um, neutrality agreement recognized by everybody. You are neutral. You will never join NATO, except the Crimea is forever Russia, except the independence of Lugansk and Donetsk and de NATO, your military. Uh, you know, people keep saying, well, Ukraine wasn't a NATO member. Well, pretty much. Uh, they had a, a regular army of 240,000 guys who were trained, equipped. Uh, they wore the uniforms um, of, of NATO. Oh. Oh, yeah. Last year, we sent 20,000 NATO troops into Ukraine to train them. We sent, uh, I think, around 12,000 Ukrainian troops outside of Ukraine to train with NATO in every country in Europe. Uh, They use the same tactics, the same communication, the same weapons. They wear the uniforms. They are a proxy army of NATO. And so the Russian perspective is we can't have a NATO proxy here. So your military is going bye-bye. You could create another military, but it's not going to be a NATO proxy. It'll be a Ukrainian military probably equipped by us. So our advisors are there. I mean, you know, I'm not saying the Russians are right, but that's their position. You're not going to be part of NATO. And then the last thing is denazification. That's the most difficult one because it pretty much means that anybody that's in the military, police, security service, whatever that possesses, has to go. And by go, the Russians mean die. Um, These they're not these aren't people that are going to be given mercy. Uh, Some of their leaders might be given a trial and put in jail. But if you got a swastika tattooed on your body, you're going to die when you're captured. And I know that's a violation of Geneva Convention. I know. I'm just stating the the simple fact. Yeah. And then about the political groups that have formed, they must be disbanded and Ukrainian law must be rewritten so that it outlaws worship of Stepan Bandera, outlaws celebration of, um, you know, the, the 12th SS division, which I think was the Galatian division where the Ukrainians served. Uh, basically, it bans in a similar fashion to what Germany did at the end of the Second World War by banning, you know, continued adulation of Adolf Hitler and uh, embrace of the of Nazi memorabilia, Ukraine has to go through the same thing regarding Stepan Bandera. That's what uh, the U.S. was one of three countries to vote against when it went in front of the U.N. was uh, Nazi glorification. Yeah, because we because we in, if we voted for that, we would be basically humiliating the Ukrainian government because it is a government that resides over a nation that glorifies Nazi ideology. I so, mean, I'm just saying as it is. <laughs> How do you see economically this this playing out? Well, actually, I think Putin is prepared very well. I mean, okay. there's only so much you can do when you live in a world where the dollar dominates, where U.S. banking institutions are controlled by Washington. You know, I mean, where global banking institutions are controlled by Washington, D.C. Yeah. There's only so much preparation you can do. Understand that the Russians have yet to unleash their counterattack, which they say is coming. But we're getting certain hints about this. Uh, Russia has, uh, I think, is moving towards uh, the gold standard for the ruble, which will r- radically change everything, because now it makes the ruble a, uh, a, a denomination that, that can be traded on the international stage because it's linked to gold, uh, as opposed to the U.S. dollar that's linked to you know $60 trillion of debt. And, and, and you're going to see the, the deconstruction of the, the dollar monopoly. And that's one of the things that Russia and China are working. You know, the Russians don't do anything half anything you know, you want. half-assed. There's nothing half-assed about the Russians. They're not always right. Uh, the decisions they make aren't always the brightest. 
But you need to respect the fact that they don't act on a whim. When the Russians undertake a policy, such as going into Ukraine, they have staffed out all possible ramifications, knowing full well that there were going to be economic sanctions left on on why? Because Biden's been telling them for more than a year. Yeah. And so they yeah. have anticipated everything. They have game played everything. They have options for everything. One of the things that Biden didn't game play is um, look at the price of gas in Europe, right? Uh, from what I read, uh, Michelin tires out of France had to shut down production because they can't afford to continue to operate with the energy prices. You're going to see more and more European industry shut down because they can't afford to go. Europe's going to shut down. And Russia hasn't shut off gas. So just imagine when Putin's waiting there going, wait for it, wait for it. Boom, done. Now what are you going to do, Europe? You're going to die. And it's your fault. The United States right now is in a panic about oil. Hell, we're trying to talk to the Iranians to sell us oil now. And, and Maduro. The delegation to Venezuela who recognized Maduro. I feel sorry for Juan Guaido because he thought he was president of Venezuela. <laughs> no, he's not. Apparently, Nicolas Maduro is because that's who we're talking to. Meanwhile, the price of oil is going through the roof. Somebody just came out and said, you know, you're going to be paying $300 a barrel if you're not careful. And Russia hasn't done a damn thing. Russia is holding on to so many cards right now. And when they start slapping them down, they're going to pick us apart at the seams. They're going to suffer. There's no doubt about it. I have family in Moscow. My wife's brother and his family live there, and they are suffering. There's no doubt that they're suffering. But Russia will survive. It'll be tough. They'll tighten their belt. It won't be easy. Europe, on the other hand, isn't going to survive. And let's just look at one last thought here. Vladimir Putin has been in power for 20, 22 years, 23 years. Find me his Western counterpart that's been in power half that long. Every single person that's opposing him right now of these democracies will be out of office before Vladimir Putin leaves office. Most of them will be out of office this time next year because of the political ramifications of the decisions they made regarding sanctions, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, all these people that are painting, as you said, their fingernails and their eyelids and all this stuff. Um, you can do that when you have food in your belly, heat in your stove, electricity in your house. You can do that when trucks are delivering things to your markets. That's not going to be happening soon in Europe. And Europe's going to be wondering how they're going to. I'd like to see Germany tell me how they're going to pay the hundred billion dollars to uh, modernize their military when their economy's in the toilet. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mr. Schultz doesn't. Uh, Schultz doesn't have long for political office. He's he's doomed. And Russia hasn't even begun to play their cards. When they do, my prediction is Europe will be all but knocked out, and you're going to rapidly see Europe reversing course. You've already seen some of that, where Germany has just come out and said. We can't stop. The, we have to have Russian energy pouring in. We can't stop it. But Germany's already set Russia up where they can stop it if they want to through violation of contracts. Germany now has to be careful with what the United States does because anything that's seen as a contractual violation gives the Russian 100% legal reason to shut down the energy. Russia owns Europe right now. Now, Russia has always wow. played, played it smart by saying we don't play the energy card. They didn't. Who played the energy card first? The West. And the West yeah. is going to pay. That's my prediction. And now they've, uh, you know, purged with some of the few outlets where you could get that type of context. Uh, yeah. Most people don't know. I was about to have you on Redacted tonight. And, you know, now now that's shut down because apparently the, the uh, U.S. can't handle any uh, dissenting opinions. But thank you so much, uh, Scott Ritter. Uh, such pleasure. Um, and he got everything right about the war on Iraq when everyone said he was wrong and he was out of his mind. Uh, those are the type of interviews I, I do, if you're new to what I do. Yeah, thanks a lot for your time. And uh, I'll be doing these more regularly. And keep fighting.